build a process and a profile around a specific set of search criteria, and then at least present to the broker, even if you're personally, you buy landscaping, you buy construction, you buy HVAC, present to the broker as, hey, I'm Josh, the HVAC searcher. Hey, I'm Josh, the landscaping searcher. And at least share why that specific search in that industry is important for you because that's the way you become memorable and that helps you make better decisions. Welcome to the Before You Buy or Sell a Business podcast, where we help buyers and sellers learn more about the acquisition process, discuss recent transactions, and stay up to date on the latest news in the market. Here's your host, Jared Johnson. All right, welcome back, Josh. Thank you. I'm excited to be back. I think it's been, what, it was 2022 when we last did this? It's been a minute. Yeah, I just checked. So obviously, you know, we got Josh Levine on today. So the first time we had you on was actually episode five. And I don't know if you remember this, but you said that there were 42 steps to buying a business. And I had so many people kind of reach out to me and I still have people that'll call me and be like, is there really 42 steps? And then (laughs) I even have a couple of brokers that joke about it now. Um, And sometimes I forget what they're talking about and they're like, yep, you know, we're on step, you know, 36 of 42. And I'm like, oh, that was Josh. So how you been? I'm good. I'm I'm happy that article made an impact. That's still our most read article by like a significant margin on the website. So that I think was maybe the first thing we ever published on the private market lab site. And uh, my co-founder and I basically sat down and said, what are all of the things a person might have to do when acquiring a small business? And just wrote a little paragraph about each one. And we got to 40, I think we had like 41 that we split one because we liked 42, <laughs> the Checkers Guides of the Galaxy reference. Um, but, um, not everyone goes through all 42 steps, obviously. And a number of them are, you know, decide how to search, decide where your sources are going to be, decide, you know, where your financing is coming from. So to some extent there were, we drew it out a little bit, but yeah, it's, it's an involved process for sure. I would say there's probably been a few that I've done more than 42, (laughs) but (laughs) it sure feels that way sometimes, but either way, I'm, uh, I'm glad to have you back. I know you and I catch up from time to time. And since 2022, a lot's happened in the market and the industry. Um, so kind of wanted to just bring you back and, and we can talk about a couple different things. Um, I think we'll leave it fairly open. You and I seem to have some pretty good conversations and I'm hoping we'll be able to uh, draw some really good bits and pieces out of this that searchers can use to to kind of figure out their path to the 42 steps. You know, I think maybe we could start off with you just kind of telling us, um, you know, what you've been up to uh, with Private Market Labs and then, you know, just anything from there as well. Yeah. Um, awesome. And yeah, fantastic to be back. And, you know, you've been on I think now we're we're gonna be even. I think you've been on my pod twice, so now we're gonna be two and two. Um, cool. <clears throat> yeah, what we've been up to at Private Market Labs. I think last time I was on this podcast, we were really in the early development stages. We hadn't even released a product yet. At this point, you know, now we've got a full marketplace out up and running. Um, what it does is it matches people with opportunities based on their investment thesis. We use AI to analyze and understand the scope of on-market deals. So we're really focused on that brokerage side of the world. And we can talk a little bit more about why we decided to do that and you know the broker versus proprietary of it all. Um, and uh, over the last couple of months, at least, we've been focused a lot on data and data quality. So trying to make sure that we you know, are... Uh, drawing deals and information from the best possible sources, trying to make sure that we're able to present helpful and interesting information like comps and you know medians and things like that for for users to help them get a little bit more context, um, and really trying to educate people on the shape of the the industry. So I think that we talk to a lot of people at Private Market Labs who are looking for a specific deal. You know, say, hey, I'm looking for one million of EBITDA. And I wanted in, you know, one of you know a specific industry, and I wanted to be, you know, low customer concentration and continuously profitable, and you know that's that's great. That's kind of like the picture of the perfect business in in everybody's mind. But everyone's envisioning that same perfect business. When you look at the scope, especially of the on market uh, deals, right, more than half are small, you know, under 500k in price. Right. So all automatically you end up with a deal scale that is typically smaller than the desired business of the actual searcher. And so really when you're acquiring a business, there's a lot of compromises. And I think the best advice that I've heard was from Jim Sharp at the Harvard uh, conference last fall. And he said, 
don't worry about finding a perfect business. Find a good business quickly. Because ultimately, you know, the more time you spend searching, there are opportunity costs involved in, you know, you're not earning that cash flow. Or if you're a traditional searcher, your time on your salary is ticking down over time. So how do we sort of find a business that is good, that pencils, that works, but is also, you know, attainable and findable and fits the shape of the market as we see it? So I think that's a, that's the, a broad challenge. And I know that's not the question you asked, but overall kind of what I'm thinking about right now. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I feel free to just kind of spew all <laughs> of your <laughs> great knowledge. Yeah, <laughs> I know you and I, I kind of were trying to figure out exactly what we should talk about. And one of the things that we wanted to talk about was kind of just searching in general and maybe a little bit more of kind of the the balance of life um, and, and what searching should kind of bring to that and how to find the right business. So Maybe we could get into that a little bit, um, and I'm sure we'll see kind of where it takes us. Yeah, that's that's perfect. So I think that one of the big questions that comes up in that direction is where should I, where am I thinking about finding my deal? Am I going to be talking to brokers? Am I going to be going proprietary? Am I going to find some kind of hybrid between the two? You know, I'll lay all my cards out on the table. Private Market Labs focuses on broker deals. So clearly we like brokers and we like broker deals. Here's why. Broker deals are more likely to close and they tend to close faster. This is because one, the sellers and broker deals are already motivated to close. They are available for sale. They've been thinking about it. They're ready to go. Two, even in a situation where the broker is not providing a lot of help, the broker is still helping the, the seller put their financials together, get themselves mentally ready to go, pull information help them understand the process. That's really uh, underrated in this process. Three, you're in a situation where as you go through that process, there's like this initial, people talk about there's an initial excitement, right? Oh, you know, we're interested in each other. This business is going to be great. Everyone's really excited. And then you start to get into this, you know, the, the doldrums of the due diligence process, the doldrums of the LOI process, and people can lose motivation. They can start to dislike each other. Buying a business isn't inherently, even though you try to make it cooperative, it can be an adversarial relationship between the buyer and the seller. Everyone is trying to get the maximum amount that they can. And the broker plays an important role helping manage the seller's emotions and understanding of the process through that process. Some brokers are much better than others, and we, we admit that and we know that, but we also know that without a broker, there are some situations where, where a buyer we'll look at a non-broker deal and say, oh, this seller's going to think I'm their, just like their long lost grandkid and they're going to want to sell to me only and I'm going to continue their legacy. And that that does happen, but not that often. And you're more likely to have a seller who when stuff gets hard, they have no one to turn to, maybe they'll get cold feet. It's a little bit, it, it's just not as seamless. So that's one reason why we think broker deals should be a part of every portfolio. Proprietary deals are also important. So we also recommend people look proprietary. We don't think you should look only brokered or only proprietary, but do a combination of both. I'll say that you know the, the benefits are, are flipped. So you're much more likely to find a, a deal that is a little bit cheaper because you're the only buyer talking to that seller. And you're more likely to build that close relationship. If you can find a really great proprietary deal, it can be to your benefit. The challenges with the proprietary deals are they've, the data has become very ubiquitous and there are a lot of really good data providers for off-market deals. And we, we all know who they are, right? But like people are subscribing to one or two of the same companies using the same data sets, PPP loans, the Secretary of State data, the SBA data, like everyone's using the same data formatted in a slightly different way. And what it means is that a much higher percentage of off-market sellers have heard from a searcher before. They These people are, are smart. They've been running successful businesses. And if, they're, if, if you've reached out to that seller, it's likely, it's becoming more likely that someone else has already reached out to them too. And that sort of, oh, wow, I didn't even know it was possible to sell my business to an individual person. That piece of it is just, it's still there, but it's just a little less prominent. So you're still facing some competition. Obviously, on the brokerage side, because of the growth in the number of searchers, um, broker deals are as competitive as ever. And you know we're still dealing with that too. I'm not going to say, oh, broker deals are a cakewalk either. 
I would say that it's generally a challenging process and, you know, there's just a lot of considerations on both sides. Yeah, I do feel like there's been a um, pick a side, I guess is what we'd call it, um, in the search world. And a lot of the searchers just can't stand brokers. And then um, same with uh, sometimes with the sellers, right? They feel like, oh, they're too expensive. You know, they're just they're just trying to pump up my my price, take their money, or a lot of them feel like they waste their time. So I think maybe the the major caveat is there's more of a divide between like good brokers and bad brokers. And I, th I feel like over the last 10 years, I'm seeing it kind of swing to where you're starting to see a little bit better um, brokers, like, you know, kind of coming to the surface. Um, and so for me, kind of like what I consider a better broker is somebody that definitely completely understands valuation they're using real world financial information from tax returns or, you know, even maybe doing a quality of earnings, doing something to verify that financial information. So when they're determining the value, they're basing it off of something that a savvy buyer is going to use and what they're going to look at, especially if they need any kind of lending. And from there, they're listing it properly and then they're working as more of an independent person in the middle of the transaction to try to get both sides to come to an agreement and then also trying to keep them on track. Um, so oftentimes when I have a searcher say, oh, well, I'm just looking for a deal without a broker. I hate brokers. I don't want anything to do with a broker. I usually try to get them to understand, hey, look, I've been doing this a lot longer than you. Let me try to explain to you. I, I do understand your frustrations and where you know you're you're coming from and what you're likely hearing from other searchers in the industry. However, here's a, an example of a great broker, and here's how they're bringing it to market, and then here's how they're getting the deal from you know start to finish, and how they can really help. And then I also can give a lot of good examples where there's deals without a broker. And I feel like if I'm doing the financing, I kind of end up being the broker um, <laughs> yeah, you know, without getting the huge paycheck that the brokers get. Um, and so it's, if, if anything, I, I do, I do like having a broker there because you've got kind of a buffer, especially again, a good broker who's going to jump in, help collect things, help shepherd the deal across the finish line. But when there's not a broker, it can be very frustrating as a lender being in the middle of it because I'm trying to get, you know, basically play broker, but then also be the lender and then trying to get everybody on the same page. And I, I don't have any kind of authority or ability to, you know, push push one, uh, you know, from one side to the other. And we still get those deals done. Um, they just seem to be a little bit more of a challenge. So I think the the biggest takeaway is like, finding the good brokers who know what they're doing um, don't list deals that won't sell and then use real world information to come up with that valuation and make sure they're in the the world of where they should be when it comes to a multiple it, it really makes a big difference compared to just just searching and saying i'm not ever going to talk to a broker or look at a broker deal so yeah i feel like both sides are just tired of each other a little bit too <laughs> yeah and I think it's it, there's sort of an it, we're in this interesting world where because of the higher interest rates, right? You have people who say, "Well, I would buy a smaller deal, but the loan doesn't pencil if the deal is too small, or if the deal doesn't, doesn't have enough cash flow, or yeah. the deal won't pencil unless I'm working 75 hours a week in this business." And really, what I was trying to do is I want to work 40 hours a week as a manager and do, you know, care for my family and I want to bring on an operating partner, right? People have all these different reasons why they search. And I think some of the frustration is that the deals that do pencil, the large ones are so competitive, you get to a position where some brokers who might be a little bit more unscrupulous are in a position where they don't have to pay so much attention to you. They don't have to provide such good service because there's a lot of buyers. And so we give I give buy this, buyers this advice all the time, right? If the broker has an NDA that you don't like, review every NDA, review it for terms you don't like, but know that it's always going to be a balance between, hey, if you don't want to sign that NDA or you want to redline that NDA, that broker is always going to have a buyer that's willing to sign it. And that's frustrating for buyers who are smart and thoughtful, but it's sort of the nature of the market. And I think that coming into it with expectations can be important. Yeah, I've definitely seen uh, a, a large upswing in the size of deals that I've been seeing, which 
is kind of good and bad, right? You look at it and say, hey, as a lender, you know, yes, of course, if I can do three to $5 million deals every transaction, it makes things a lot easier. Um, you know, if I'm doing an average of 70 transactions a year, if, you know, the average was a million five and now moves to 2.5, 3.5, it, it definitely helps, right, with the overall volume. But what a lot of people don't understand is on those larger transactions, it is very competitive. You're starting to see people continue to push the multiples up and up and up to where those deals almost don't work sometimes. Um, and then you're also seeing where a lot of the searchers in that world are a, a bit nervous just because of the size and it's a huge transaction for them. And so what I see ha happen often is the second something just doesn't look right or doesn't line up perfectly, they're just pulling the cord and they're done. And I'm sitting there going, okay, we've got to start over. We've got to find another right. deal. And, it, you know, and it's just kind of like on the transactions from, I would say maybe 750 to like 2 million, they seem to be people that are buying that aren't necessarily a quote unquote searcher. They're looking to buy and take over a business, apply their skill set to it and move forward. And it's something that is going to really take care of their family. So mm -hmm. then they're a lot more invested in trying to see the deal all the way through and getting it done. So you kind of have this, this odd like balance of like, oh, it's a bigger transaction. Okay, well, when it's done, it'll be done. <laughs> if not, we're going to do it again. Um, yeah. And then the other ones, I'm like, okay, we're going to do everything we can to get this across the finish line because this person is is heavily involved. So I think it's just the, the different kind of world of what, what people are looking for and what they're looking to acquire. So. And I think that that's, that becomes a bit of a superpower, especially in a more competitive environment, is a buyer that really knows what they want and are focused from a thesis perspective that can make a big difference when it comes to, hey, I'm Josh and I want to preserve your legacy and I'm looking for a deal with a million EBITDA and I'm you know, industry agnostic. That might sound good, but it, it's, it's, much, it's not as good as I'm Josh, I'm interested in manufacturing companies, I'm interested in manufacturing companies that are specifically doing plastic mold injection and here's the reason why and here are the people that are advising me and here's how I'm doing it because that focus lets you quickly weed out the deals that are poor fits and then you get a much stronger sense of okay here's the scope of plastic bolt injection manufacturing companies over a million dollars in purchase price right now and let's say if there are 35 of them and i've looked at all 35 i can say to myself okay i generally know what i'm looking for i know what's a, what a quality deal looks like i know what a bad deal looks like and it allows you to be patient with a purpose when you have that kind of intentionality behind your thesis. And so what we try to do at Private Market Labs is we know people come in and we, we catch a lot of searchers early in their journey too. Uh, and we know people come in and they may not know exactly what they're looking for. So we try to push them towards, hey, build a process and a profile around a specific set of search criteria and then at least present to the broker, even if you're personally, you buy landscaping, you buy construction, you buy HVAC, present to the broker as, hey, I'm Josh, the HVAC searcher. Hey, I'm Josh, the landscaping searcher. And at least share why that specific search in that industry is important for you because that's the way you become memorable and that helps you make better decisions. Yeah, I think that's some great advice. Um, and we do see, you know, I'll get the emails as well. And, you know, hey, I'm looking for, and it's always some, you know, form of EBITDA, right? Uh, $400,000 in EBITDA up to a million and, I've got investors, this and that. And a lot of times I'm like, okay, well, I get a lot of listings on the front end that I'm looking at, but you're not telling me exactly what you're looking for. If anything, what it's signaling to me is that you're going to look at a lot of things and find any reason to move on to something <laughs> else. So if you tell me I am looking for you know X, Y, and Z, next time one of those comes, I'm going to remember it. I'm going to go straight to you. Here you go. Let's put the deal together. Let's move on. And so, yeah, I think, I think you're right. So you, you have a, a good pulse on kind of who's coming in from search and then also from a seller side, right? From the broker, kind of what um, you're seeing in the, in the way of like what's being listed from time to time and then also who's looking. So if you had to kind of summarize maybe the last year of maybe some, some changes that you're noticing or some trends 
Um, you know, what are you seeing? And then from there, based on that information, and I know you're a data guy like me, so (laughs) I'm sure you you pay attention to this. What are you, you know, what are you kind of thinking is going to happen in the like business acquisition searcher market in maybe the next 12 to 18 months as well? And this is your catching with a question that I always ask people on my podcast too. So it's just like shoes on the other foot. Um, there you go. I think one thing that we've seen a lot of is is really the growth in the number of searchers is shaping the market a lot. And I think that there are a lot of searchers and there are a lot of providers trying to facilitate search. You know, we're a provider facilitating search. There's a lot of companies that have popped up that are trying to do this from with a number of different angles. And it feels a lot like there's kind of like the very experienced like haves and have nots just on, on the on the buyer side specifically where you've got buyers who have done a transaction before or are corporate buyers who have who can buy in cash or are PE or roll up or whole co buyers who really know what they're doing and people who are putting out a lot of LOIs. They're really moving fast and trying to get stuff under LOI, get stuff to the due diligence process. And the problem is that's expensive, right? Once you get to due diligence, you have to pay for everything. And that can be very frustrating. So you end up in a position where the people with the deepest pockets are able to move a lot faster. And you have a lot of people who are search curious because of all the media attention we've gotten. And yet it sort of feels like the same types of people that we've seen in the past are the ones that are actually closing deals. And then you have people, kind of this new wave of searchers are not closing deals or are not closing deals very fast. And what it does, though, is even in a world where like underlying the market is, it looks semi-similar, what you have is you have a lot of noise now. And so it becomes harder like to, to bubble your way up to the top, which is why the, the thesis piece is so important. On the, on the seller side, um, I think that there's what, what I'm hearing from people is that the explosion in deal volume hasn't really happened at the pace that people had hoped. You know, we have this, you know, sort of quote unquote, like silver tsunami, you know, movement that people talk about a lot. And I think we haven't seen, you know, a single year with, oh, wow, there's a 25% increase in the number of sellers on the market right now. And we, I think there's a number of reasons for that. COVID played a big part, um, really set people back. And when you're looking at the financials for these deals, the 2020 and 2021 numbers are always really weird. And you see a lot of sellers who will... Um, like in, in the manufacturing space, for example, I've looked at a few of those deals recently. In the manufacturing space, you'll have deals where, especially if you're a job shop, you've taken on, you took on a lot of smaller jobs in 2020 and 2021 to try to make up for a volume that you weren't sure was going to come back. So maybe revenue is up and then margins are down and then revenue drops while margins go up. And it, it can just be a function of like you're adjusting your operations to try to like pay everybody and make sure they can put food on the table or you're taking care of your people as a searcher the numbers look a little odd so i think that that story from the seller has become choppy and we've also seen people you know just in general right social security is people are less confident in that there is this general conversation around people are retiring a lot later um, with inflation it takes more to retire comfortably and so you end up in a position where we might say, oh, it's a silver tsunami. So many people are over the age of 55. It's like, you might be working an additional 20 years if you're 55. So I, I think that we are not, we're sort of calibrating our expectations around like a 60 year old person retiring when in reality, these people are like kings of their own kingdom in terms of their small business and healthy at 60 and not looking to to, to exit at any time. Like my, my dad is, I think 67 at this point and he's working 75 hours a week, like a maniac. And I, I can't imagine, you know, he, he just, he's, he's still got it and he's still really, really focused and working super hard. And I would say that a lot of very high achieving people, you know, being the baby boomer generation who have been high achieving and, you know, really grew up working super hard and fought for everything that they earned they're just going to keep working. So I, you know, maybe we need to calibrate those expectations about a volume increase a little bit. Yeah, I, I think so. I think you're right. Um, I did see a jump because of COVID on mm. people that, and I think what it did was kind of cast a spotlight on, yeah, I guess what it was is like people started being able to work from home. Right. So they, they started moving around the country, but then people also started looking at okay, well, if I can work from home, what else can I do? And so then people started saying, 
oh, I can buy a business. I had no idea I could do that. And so we saw kind of this, this shift. Um, at the same time, you had a lot of SBA lenders that jumped into buying, you know, providing financing for buying a business when they don't normally do that at that point in time because of a, a bunch of different reasons. The main reason was the secondary market for SBA loans shot up and almost doubled. Mm -hmm. um, at the same time, they got 90% guarantee. And then the on the secondary market, they didn't have anywhere to buy any any kind of security. So they went and started buying the pools of SBA loans, which drove up the the price that they were paying, which then caused a lot of lenders to kind of go off thesis and start doing this type of lending, which then drove, you know, the, the prices up and, and more people to sell. And then now that's kind of settling down um, mm -hmm. where we're getting back to just having a few lenders um, that are kind of the normal players in that space, especially as the secondary market has, has come down to about 50 percent of what it was at that point in time. Um, so you had this kind of weird a uh, spotlight out of nowhere onto buying businesses. And I, and I feel like we saw kind of a, a jump. And then as you're mentioning, when you move now a year, two years past it, you're looking and saying, well, I don't know if I want to buy that or what's it really worth? It's hard to tell. Do we go back and look at 2019, 2018? Do we look at, you know, 2023? And most people had a great 23. And so they're like trying to sell the business based on that, but it was still was nowhere near 2019. So it's like this yeah. weird, uh, you know, place where nothing, there's no consistency. And so I think it's, it's slowed down. And then when you pair that with really high interest rates and, you know, especially as compared to, we had this like about a 10 year run where Wall Street Journal Prime was, was basically the same. So, and it, and it was crazy because I remember then people still complaining about rate <laughs> and now they're like, oh, well, I can't measure exactly how the business is doing because I don't have any consistency. Rates are high. You know, everybody's still a little nervous about the economy and, and kind of what, what's going on there. Um, and so I think it kind of put a little bit of a breaks on what we thought we were going to see um with uh you know an avalanche of deals hitting the market so um do you think that it's going to stay that way where it's going to be kind of steady or do you think we will have sometime in the next year two years three years this big pop where a bunch of stuff hits the market that's really hard to, it's a hard question i would say that demographics suggest right that at some point there will be more pe there will be more sellers retiring than there are right now just just because you know we are human beings with you know ticking time you know ticking clocks on all of us and you know we're going to live a certain amount of time and you know medicine could you know you know continues to improve and everything like that but people don't want to work forever and or not everybody wants to work forever my dad excluded and uh, <laughs> um, you end up in a position where you probably will have a, an increasing number of people retiring, but I don't know if we're going to see like the big pop necessarily. Um, I'm curious, you mentioned something a couple of minutes ago that was really fascinating. Um, from your seat as a lender, what are you seeing in terms of businesses that are operable from home, right? So we talk about this movement of people saying, oh, I, I'm not tethered to an office. I can work from home. But then a lot of the searcher businesses are these like, you know, service, like in-person sort of service businesses, are you seeing growth and demand on like, you know, SaaS and e-commerce or as a lender, are you seeing more deals like that um, because of this work? And do you think it's because of this work from home movement? Um, I would say I, I'm, I'm probably seeing the same um, amount of volume and that with the SaaS businesses, I get a lot of people looking for SaaS but I don't do a lot of them because the multiples are so high. And so what happens is, especially with, with high interest rates, when you're looking at a five to seven time multiple, which is, which is not uncommon for a SaaS business, it's squeezing the cash flow so hard that we can't get comfortable with it. The only time I've seen people have been able to do that is if they're putting in a large amount on the front end for themselves, or they've got a large seller carry note, you know, if they've got to get kind of creative with the financing, in order to get that done. Um, I definitely have seen an uptick in people looking for that, but then normally it's kind of funny because I'll hear somebody say, oh, I'm looking for SaaS. And I almost immediately like 
say in my head, like, we can't do that. And <laughs> so I, and I kind of try to get them to understand, look, here's the thing, the cash flow that it's, that it's actually, you know, putting out, I understand that it's recurring, which is fantastic, which is why you want to buy it. Um, however, the multiple that that you're actually looking at on a day to day basis is not going to work at you know 90 percent leverage. So um, if you want to get to 60 percent, 70 percent somehow, then we could probably get it to work. But otherwise, it doesn't meet you know normal SBA and bank guidelines. Um, and then as far as like e-commerce, um, I, I do feel like there was a huge run on that in maybe 2017, 2016, I saw a ton of that happen. And a lot of those deals didn't end up working out. Um, and, and I was at a lender that uh, had somebody that kind of specialized in those and a lot of them went bad. It was it was really sad and it was it was really bad. So I think since then, though, um, a lot of the e-commerce that does hit the market and that is selling seem to be a, a little bit more of a consistency like you would see in manufacturing or in the service-based businesses where it's not one year of just going through the moon and then trying to sell it's it's a steady increase or it's even just kind of flat with just a, a real small increase so we see a lot of people looking for those and then i've been seeing more stuff kind of in you would still consider it I guess more of like a service base, but it's it's kind of more of like white collar service. So CPA firms, um, you know, you're starting to see more of those where a lot of that can be run from home, right? Um, I've done a couple of uh, tax firms this year, and it's usually them kind of rolling them up. So they've already got one, they're acquiring another one. And what they're really doing is just grabbing these people that are are preparing financials or even doing bookkeeping from home. And it's uh, a lot of them, they're buying them and then eliminating the office. Um, so you're seeing people kind of realize that they can operate that way. But I'm not necessarily seeing um, somebody out saying, I'm searching for a business that does not have a, a specific location um, or something that I can kind of turn into a home based business. So. I, you know, I'm, I'd be curious to see if there's any kind of data on that. But I, I do think the the main thing that the work from home movement did for search and for business acquisitions was it allowed people to move out of their normal you know area. Like a lot of people wanted to live somewhere else in the country and it gave them the opportunity to do that. Then when they did that, then they started saying, oh, well, there's businesses I could buy in this yeah. area or they said, I want to buy a business. I'm not, you know, constrained to one part of the country. So if I find a business in Florida and I currently live in Texas, well, buy a move in Florida. So right. it it kind of gave people that ability to to think outside the box and move. So, you know, I, I, but I do feel like a lot of that's kind of started to settle down. Hmm. Um, and we're going back to kind of the traditional buying a business, uh, you know, based on cash flow because of you know, the three main reasons you want to buy and then kind of going from there. So I'm kind of curious to see what happens in the next year or two years. I think a lot of it's going to be tied to the interest rates. And I do feel like there's buyers on the sidelines and sellers on the sidelines kind of waiting for for that to go down. And then I also feel like there's a lot of people with the existing businesses that they're doing OK. They're not doing fantastic. They're keeping their head above water, but they're in no way thinking about acquiring their competitor. Um, and if rates come down and the business does a little bit better or it's going to be a little bit cheaper for them to go acquire their competitor, then we'll probably see some more mergers and some more roll up going on. Um, so we'll see what happens with with the rates. It's like every time they, they meet where everybody's going, oh, maybe this will be the time. And then it just, nope, we're going to stay flat. And here's yeah. why. And I don't necessarily disagree with them not dropping it at this point. I, I feel like um, inflation really hasn't gotten under control and hasn't come down. Um, so until that does happen, I think it, it kind of makes sense. And there's still a lot of deals getting done. So it's not like it just dried up and everybody's sitting on their hands. It's stuff still getting done. But if those people are looking to buy now because they're assuming it's going to go down and they're going to be able to take advantage of it, then it's it's probably a good play if it works. <laughs> um, you know, if it goes the other way, then it'll it'll be another challenging couple of years. But we'll see what happens. So, a million a million things to respond to there. I, that was like just amazing. Um, on the SaaS piece, 
I we see a lot of similar to you, we see a lot of people on the platform looking for SaaS companies. The challenge with a SaaS company, like a pure SaaS company, is you're starting to get into these slightly more like venture style valuations if you're just looking for a pure SaaS company and venture venture aware owners. So for example, if you're um like a lot of if you're on like the venture startup sort of side of the the spectrum, you're getting oftentimes valued at a multiple of revenue or you're going to get acquired at like a 10x of revenue or something like that. And so for a person that says, hey, I want a $2 million EBITDA SaaS company, it's like, hey man, like that's that's cool and all, but that might be a $50 million deal, right? Again, and you know, I, I think that, that that's part of the challenge. Um, to your point, the people who have been able to focus on, well, what I'm interested in is set, what I want to do is like a, like a tech-enabled services company, and specifically I'm interested in healthcare. Okay, well, that's a little bit easier because then we can really say, okay, well, what is a, can we find you like a home health agency that is starting to implement like some modern technology for, you know, tenant management or for, you know, for, for some of their services and, you know, or can you find a traditional business and implement the technology that you're interested in when you get there? And, you know, particularly with AI, it's become much easier to build over the last few years. So I think people applying technology to traditional businesses is also another play for those who want to have a more tech enabled business. So I think that that's been super interesting. The other thing you just touched on that I thought was interesting was this idea of still around the interest rate question. And what's been interesting for me is as a person who is sort of a, a active lurker on, you know, small business, social media for a while. And especially, you know, when I started investigating this space in you know, late 2020, early 2021, up until now, it felt like sort of during that 2021 boom when interest rates were super low and there was a lot of like, you know, celebration of like, look at this amazing thing that we discovered, you know, by a small business. And we're still sort of riding some of the momentum of that. But then if you look at sort of what people are talking about on small business kind of social media now, a lot of conversation around like, hey, operating this business is really hard and my margin for error to make that service is really, really low. And part of that is just because those interest payments are so much higher now than they were, you know, four years ago. And if you sort of make through that choppy initial period and you're, you know, borrowing at a much lower rate, your margin for error is is better. And so you have a lot of successful searchers also who are coming out and saying, hey, I bought my business in 2019. I bought my business in, you know, 2021. I'm doing great. I'm going to go reinvest. I'm looking for searchers. So then you see this infusion of like searcher focused capital coming in, which I think is great. And you know, we, you know, fantastic to see it. And so it's kind of like still a little bit haves and have nots, but um, an interesting time to be, to be here. Yeah. And I, I think you bring up a good point. I was actually talking to someone about that yesterday on the kind of transparency around buying the business. Um, it, it kind of reminds me a little bit of like, maybe it kind of comes in waves. You know, you had, people flipping houses and then you had crypto and then you, <laughs> you know, and so now it's kind of like, has it sort of made its way to buying a business? Hopefully not at the same scale and you don't attract the same people because I feel like there was a lot of people that got into some of that stuff that had no business getting into it. Mm -hmm. um, and I feel like part of the, the way to keep them out is that as long as the lenders are doing a good job, kind of saying like filtering them out, then it should keep it that way. But there's so much on social media about buying a business where they make it feel like, yeah, you just buy a business and it, it runs itself and it's great. And I here's all the money I make and I'm driving in my Ferrari. And <laughs> like, it's not the case. I mean, there's there's so many things that and that go on that make it just really challenging. So I think it's good for, for people to kind of see both sides there. There's definitely great uh, buys that people make and and maybe they put in really good people and it, it works. But then I feel like nobody ever pays attention to how difficult it is to get to that point. So it's it's fun to it's fun to like actually hear the real stories, you know, what goes on. So Yeah. And I think, you know, all these things, you know, stated, you know, with caution and with transparency, you know, optimist hat back on a little bit. I have to have a fake hat. I don't have a cool cowboy hat. I'm like a failure <laughs> of a Texan a little I'll bit. I'll send but, you one. Yeah, please. <laughs> <laughs> um Buying a business is still one of the most interesting and fruitful ways to generate like new wealth from like this like burgeoning class, like millennial and Gen Z entrepreneurs. 
And I think that you know, I think last time I was on and you know, really in the founding fabric of the company that I've been building, it's really around how do we increase opportunity for people who have been traditionally closed out of a lot of these like wealth generating systems in society. And I think that particularly as you have, you know, what we we're just talking about more searchers coming in and investing into, uh, into even in SBA deals to help provide capital for a down payment, the advent of additional seller financing, smart and thoughtful lenders. There are ways for people who are willing to, to study and learn and look at a lot of deals and, you know, be thoughtful about it. Even if you come from nothing, you can buy a small business and generate great wealth for yourself. And I think that that is saying that to be encouraging, not to say this is a way to get rich quickly and a way to get rich without any work. But it is a way to get rich for people who are working very hard and have not necessarily found themselves in a position to start off, you know, in, you know, top tier investment banking, pivot to private equity, you know, pivot to hedge funds. And now you're like, oh, I'm sitting on $2 million. I'm doing great. Like that's it. Those people will always do well. But for the people who don't have that background, this is still like pathway to longstanding family wealth. And I think that's what continues to draw interest to it. 1000% agree with you. And I, I think that is a lot of what kind of keeps me going in, in what I do, because it's a lot of work. And, and there's a lot of days where I'm frustrated, and I'm tired. Um, you know, they, there, there's a multiple of things that can go bad in a day, right. And <laughs> it's, I feel like every time I get to that point where I'm frustrated, then I have some call with, with a buyer who's like, Okay, I've been working for this person for, you know, 25 years and I've been able to save some money. You know, my my family is going to give me a little bit of money and now I want to buy this business. And then now I'm like, okay, I remember why I like doing this. Like yeah. this is really cool. You know, I mean, when when someone calls you crying saying thank you for getting their deal done, like it, it's so fulfilling, you know. So it it is really cool to see the average person be able to buy a business and even more so the people that have worked really, really hard and they would have never had that chance to to kind of be working on something to build equity for themselves rather than being a, you know, a manager and, and building equity for someone else. So, yeah, it is it is really cool to see it. And a lot of times, like right when I'm like, I need this, like somebody called me, <laughs> me yeah, they, you know, I need me. more than more than you did. And you don't know, right? Like, yeah, hundred percent. Yeah. So everybody forgets like why we do it. And, and I understand there's, there's a lot of like, you know, risk mitigation and, and everything that goes into what we all do. But at the end of the day, like, you know, the, the searchers that maybe, you know, come from your, your description of being able to sit on 2 million compared to somebody who's, you know, worked their way through a, a tough industry and has been able to save some money and get there. When we can get home on one of those deals, it, it feels a lot better. So it's definitely yeah. cool. Yeah, that's awesome. I'm doing a, um, an event later today and I was coming up with some questions to ask people. So I wanted to do kind of a rapid fire questions with you let's see let's see okay well so i'm gonna say basically something or something else and you got to pick one of them so okay all right broker or no broker broker flip or hold full loi or apa loi sba or seller carry um seller carry if you can do it but i mean you're probably gonna need sba too <laughs> all right kobe or jordan jordan all right, cool. Figure I'd throw one sports one in there for you. <laughs> we were just before we got on this pod, we were just having this long sports debate. So like, I come from the uh, the 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 Dirt Nowitzki sort of Mavericks era. So I was eleven. You know, I'm dating myself. Eleven when Dirk joined the Mavs, and so basically just grew up with him in my my childhood. And what that means is that I was. 23 when the Mavs won their title in 2011 so I mean just like my whole childhood teenage years and into my my 20s of just year after year just pain at the hands of Kobe and Shaq and Duncan and all these like <laughs> fantastic players and you know now as like this sort of long to medium suffering you know Dallas Mavericks fan continuing to be a long suffering fan is it feels like it's like in my blood to some extent i, I you know you talked about being a, a data guy right i i ran one of the 
I think it was a couple of years ago. So before the Rangers won the World Series. So my, my data set is really old. But I ran like a data set of sports futility, which was like I tried to figure out by awarding like super, super crude like point system of like, okay, five points if you win the title, four points if you get to the title, three points if you get to the conference finals, like that kind of a thing. And I did like sort of all of the major sports for all of like the top 30 cities in the United States. And I was basically trying to like manipulate the data to show that Dallas was like the most huge title sports city over the last like 30 years. And I think we were like bottom five or something. It was like, really, like a, a, a profound, profound uh, track record of futility. And then of course you've had the you know, Rangers and stars recently. So maybe a little less now, but it's, it's cer- certainly out, funny. But- yeah. Unfortunately, the Cowboys won't help you at all. So no, they're gonna go. They're going the opposite direction. So oh yeah, they'll be in last place. They're gonna they're gonna get last this year. Is my my prediction? One prediction I agree because they because they actually have a, a decent schedule for once, so they have to play somebody difficult. Madison's probably <laughs> listening right now, yelling at me. <laughs> but, oh man, well, yeah. uh, but, you know. So I usually ask two questions at the end. I think we we you know we did that last time, so maybe I'll just switch it to one. Um, you know, before I, I usually ask, you know, if you have a mentor, I think we've probably covered that before. But the the other question is, you know, what motivates you? So I'm kind of curious if that's changed at all. Um, you know, so maybe you can kind of let us know what, what motivates you to be successful. I think sort of a, a combination of just deep competitiveness, inability to sit still, and just the desire to build something for myself you know i think that i had you know a seven-year corporate career before i jumped into entrepreneurship and for me at least you know i wanted to move fast i felt like rightly or wrongly that i had the talent to be a leader and felt like the structure of my corporate jobs and not necessarily all corporate jobs are like this. There are people who have great mentors and, you know, do really well in corporate, but the structure of my corporate jobs and the, the politics and the organizations behind them did not let me sort of grow and advance and put myself in the position to, um, experience pressure and to do things that mattered quickly enough for me. And I was like, well, if I'm going to do the things that I want to do, I'm going to have to build the life that I want for myself. And um, that's kind of like this like gut, like labor capital distribution, like instinct that I had. It was like, well, I guess I, I, I want to be capital because I feel like I can be. And so that's kind of like, once you sort of make that decision, then it's, you know, full steam ahead and you got to make the best decisions that you can along the way. And in terms of the mentorship question, I think that, mentorship is important and people seek mentors at different parts of their lives. And I I think that one thing I think I mentioned last time when I've answered, when I've answered this question in the past, I've said something like, it's not so much having about having a hero. It's about like finding the individual things you admire in different people. I have recently started working more formally with a coach and that's been really valuable for me actually. And so I have, I mean, finding someone who has deep business knowledge and someone who is able to just be a sounding board, because I think one thing you learn as you grow as an entrepreneur is that there's just not always a lot of people who have experienced the things that you have, who understand sort of the peaks and the valleys. And a lot of the people that do are off running their own things and don't consistently have time. So I have kind of both a small support system of other entrepreneurs that I talk to on like a monthly basis. And then a coach that I really can get into the weeds with tactically on, on things I'm working through or decisions I have to make. And those two things have been like a nice stack for me. Whereas, you know, maybe when I started on my entrepreneurial journey, I was much more, I'm going to, you know, take it to the man and do it all myself. And as I've gained more experience, I realized that like no one who's doing well is doing it all by themselves. Oh man, that's some some great information. So, <laughs> I uh, yeah, I always appreciate talking to you. I'm sure you and I could talk for three hours. Um, Absolutely. Maybe we should just do this uh, annually, and we'll we kind should. of do an annual checkup. But so, where where can people find you? Yeah, please um, find me on. Uh, I'm gonna call it Twitter. Out of to to poke Elon a little bit. My my Austin neighbor. Um, find me on Twitter at Levine JM. 
Um, do a lot of posting about uh, SMB stuff there. Um, LinkedIn, um, privatemarketlabs.com is our website. And then we do um, a, a podcast. Our podcast is Private Market Insights. You can find that at privatemarketinsights.com. Awesome. Cool. Well, again, you know, I always love talking to you. I'm sure we'll, we'll catch up again soon. Sounds great. Great chatting Thanks. with you too. Thank you for listening. We hope you found this podcast informative and helpful. Please don't forget to subscribe on your favorite podcast player. For more information, or if you'd like to discuss a transaction, please go to www.jaredwjohnson.com.